Okay, welcome back to Let's Talk Music Tech Masterclass Sessions. Our third speaker has worked in many areas of the music industry, from light and sound engineering to composing soundtracks for films. He has set up and run a record label along with opening his own professional studio. He is currently director of Big Help Management and judges a variety of national music events. He is also building a new eco-friendly recording studio which will be finished by June 2012, if it ever stops raining. Please give a warm welcome to Dutch Van Spaal. I'm going to try and give you a, a kind of um, a more earthy feel of, of, of how I go about managing artists and what I do in my day-to-day -day job, which is not really day-to-day. -day. There's nothing routine about it. And al along that journey, I hopefully will give you a feel of how I got to that position and what I've, what I've done um, in order to kind of pick up some skills along the way. Uh, I'm not an expert, I'm still a student of the music industry. Um, I've been in it almost about 40 years now. Um, all of you lay kind of, you know, keeps me looking young. Um, I'd like to pick up on a few points that um, some of the, uh, the, the previous speakers made. Uh, first of all, a bit of a plug. Hey, technology is wonderful, that's, that's us. Um, and you can find out anything you need to know about us, just bighelpmanagement.com, and that will lead you to all of our other sites and what we do. Um, the, there's a few moral dilemmas within what people call the music industry. I don't call it the music industry. I think there's a record industry, and there's a music industry. And I often hear these dilemmas about, oh, Downloading's killing it, music's killing it, free this, free that is killing it, we're not making any money anymore. Well, yeah, I think in the record industry that's probably true, and the majors are suffering. Um, they're corporate guys, they're big boys, that's their problem. They put themselves into that position, if they can't get themselves out of it, then they don't deserve to stay in the industry. And I'm sure they will reposition themselves at some point and, and, and recover some more income stream from that. What I'm interested in is the wider music industry. And there is plenty of income stream in the music industry. There's plenty of energy there. There's a general public that is just as hungry to hear great music. And there is a never-ending source of great talent who want to provide it. All I want to do is to be that go-between to help bring those musicians to those audiences and make that thing work in an economic way so that the musicians can carry on doing that in a sustainable way and, and make at least a, a, a decent living. I can pay my bills and the audience don't feel like they're being ripped off, but they're loving it. I don't think there's any problem with the music industry at all. Downloading, yeah, everybody downloads. 95% uh, used to be the moral dilemma of what China used to do. Now we do it. Um, it's here to stay, it's never going to change, no matter what laws we bring in, rules we bring in, people do not see it as theft. They see it as just kind of pressing that button and then they can have it. And everybody does it, so where's the harm? And once you've opened that can of worms, you're not going to get them back in again. So we kind of accept that from this point onwards, I think if we all say, we're not going to make any money out of selling the recorded version of what we do. We're not going to sell enough CDs to make it worthwhile making them. We're not going to sell enough downloads to, 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 to create enough income to actually sustain the band in all that it wants to do. I think everyone pretty much accepts that within the industry that I work in anyway. We no longer make our money from selling records or selling music. Where do we make it from? Where do, we, where do you think we make it from? Any ideas? The live ticket? You can't download a live ticket. There's a big bloke at the door saying, where's your ticket? You have to buy it, or else he can't come in. There's more live tickets being sold now than there ever has been. So clearly, people have not fallen out of love with music, and they still value it enough to part company with money to buy a ticket to get in to see it. And I would say that's because it's the live experience that they crave, that shared experience of being with other people in an environment where it's coming at you, you've got mega throbs of music, it's hot and sweaty maybe, you're dancing around, there's a bit of a mosh pit, or you're kind of sitting there polite. It doesn't really matter what the situation is, you're sharing it with people and you're seeing it for real. And we spend most of our lives in front of a computer screen or in cyberspace, 
I think we crave that reality in our lives, and that's one way that we can get it back again. So I think that that live ticket experience is a good, good experience. I think people have started to fall out of love with the uh, stadium experience because it's, it's just like sitting in front of a computer screen. You go into a stadium, you need binoculars to actually see the stage, and you watch your artist on a screen. <laughs> even though they're there. You're still having a shared experience with all the people around you, which might be fun, might not be, they might be taller than you and you kind of have to dodge around, but you're still out there and you're, you're still getting a t-shirt and you can say, look, I was there, you know, that one on the tour. It's, it's something that you can do for real, rather than saying, I'm really in love with my iPod track number 653. Yeah, it's really, it's kind of, it's, it's not the same type of thing. Where else do we make the money from? Co-branding, sponsorship. Um, everybody complains about free CDs um, on the front of the Daily Mail or, or wherever it may be. They ain't free. Those CDs have been paid for by that newspaper. The artist receives money from that. You get it for nothing. Well, you don't. You have to pay for the, for the newspaper. And the advertisers in it have helped co-fund it. It's a different way of selling it. You can either go for the advertising process and sell it to 50,000 people or 100,000 people, or you sell it to one person for a larger amount and they give it to 50,000 people in a way that they find it economically viable. So it's, it's, it's still selling it, but it's selling it in a different way. Um, Costa Coffee have their own um, brand of artists. You can go into a coffee house and you can have your coffee and they'll be playing there and if you really like them there's probably a little card by the till that you can pick up and get a free iTunes download. Has anybody ever actually done that? Has anybody ever actually picked up one of those freebies and downloaded it? See, it's not real, is it? Because you can probably download it for free anyway without picking up the card. It's not a unique experience. But I bet all of you in the last 12 months have heard a song and thought, my God, I love that, I really want that and you've gone out and actually paid for something or you've worked really harder to, to download it illegally or something, but you've, you've actually craved that and wanted to have it. Has anybody gone through that experience? Good. Fantastic. Music lovers, that's what I like. So, don't fall into the trap of thinking, oh, it's a dilemma, downloading's killing it, et cetera, et cetera. It isn't killing it, it's just changing it. It's just, the people have spoken. We do not want to buy the same crap year after year we packaged, so we're not going to. Until you show us something that we think has value and is worthwhile, we ain't paying money for it. They'll pay money for the live ticket, but up until now, there's no new product that they're gonna pay money for. So, if you can think of a new way of selling music, then I think you'll be very wealthy, as long as you use it yourself without giving it away. In terms of artists, somebody mentioned earlier, are artists better or worse off? Um, I've been managing artists probably for the last 25 years of, of, of my, my career in one form or another. Uh, and as an artist manager, I need to know company law, service industry law, contract law, but most of all, people, understanding people, understanding the artists I'm looking after and understanding the people that I'm negotiating with. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the fine detail of the con contract is, as long as you know what that detail means and what's negotiable, it's getting the negotiated solution that works for your artist without negotiating them out of the contract or negotiating them into the wrong contract. Are freedoms any, any greater today than they were? No, they're not. You've just exchanged one prison for another or one limitation for another. Um, the argument that because you can access the whole world on the internet now, you've got the freedom to bring your music to everybody, you don't need a record company to do that. Well, in theory, yeah, but you could always do that. You could have put your music up on a little post and stuck it in your front garden. It has just as much effect as stick it on MySpace because you are in a very crowded marketplace. So even though you can put your, put your product out there, Nobody can see it because it's so crowded. You still need to be able to stand on somebody else's shoulders to get noticed by the public. So, it's not black and white, it's grey. The major labels, as we say, 
indie labels, all the lines are blurred, what's in major, what's in indie, but the big, the, the big corporate guys who've got money or appear to have money, but you're just secret, they haven't got any money anymore, they are still there to give advances and, and big deals, although those have, have dropped off significantly and there's very few around now. Um, and the deals never were what they seem to be. That famous quote by Robbie Williams, 90 million pounds, I'm rich beyond my wildest dreams, when he did his 360 deal with EMI. He didn't get 90 million pounds. I don't know what he got, nobody knows what he got. I, I know his manager, he won't tell me what he got, but he tells me it wasn't 90 million pounds. Deals like that and advances are staged over a period of expectations of delivery of albums, and they're usually wedge shaped, so you get the smaller bits up front and the larger bits when you deliver to expectations. All of it is subjected to the highest rate of tax and national insurance and VAT. And by the time you've sliced all that, that pie into different pieces, taking people's commissions off, the artist, as an advance, gets very little indeed. And effectively, when you're in a deal with a label and they put you into a studio and they promote the album, basically all they're doing is lending you money which you've got to pay back. The only difference between them and a bank is that you don't have to pay it back with interest. They give you an advance, that's just an interest-free loan, that when you start earning money by selling your music, you pay it back. And without naming names, because this is going to be broadcast on television later on, something like that, so if you come and talk to me later, I'll name some names face-to-face. But there are certain major artists out there who are household names, who you will know about, who are with major labels, who do not get a penny from their labels. There was one artist, I won't tell you his name, but he plays the piano and he's quite jazzy. Um, his first album sold 2.6 million copies. At that point when he'd sold 2.6 million copies, he still owed his record label 600,000 pounds because he had not recouped the cost of television advertising that the record label had spent on his behalf, over which he has had no control and still has no control. So as a manager, when you're negotiating a contract, those are the bits of the contract that I'm really interested in. It's not necessarily the advance. It's how does my artist actually earn any money from this? Contracts are big. First three pages tells you what you're going to get. The next 97 pages tells you why you're not going to get it. And it's reading the small print and then working out what you can negotiate that works for the type of artist that you have. If you haven't got a live artist, then it's pointless negotiating the live elements of it because that's of no, no worry to them or of no use. So you, you look at how your artist is going to work and how you think that artist is going to develop. Give them the advice. Advise them how you're going to negotiate it and then go and do it but do it in a business-like manner rather than trying to beat the other party over the head because that never works. One of the things that um, I'm quite keen on at the moment because uh, I tend to work most of my time with young people. And by young people, I mean teenagers. Um, we're particularly interested in finding talent, not only when it's raw, but even when th those individuals do not know that they have talent and it's quite easy to spot that. Um, we then put them through a training program, we give them all the craft skills, but we also give them the business skills, and we try to create what we call the artist entrepreneur. We teach them how to fish rather than give them a fish. We teach them how to run their own website, their own social networking, their own free marketing, and to behave in a way that has that focus, allows them to go forward, allows them to sell their product, but also allows them to bring themselves to a wider audience and look attractive to other promoters and other, um, other, other musicians, and the media in particular. And one of, the biggest, one of the biggest things that we teach them is do not expect someone is going to pluck you from obscurity and sort out your life for you. Those days are gone, and they were never there in the first place. There was never such thing as a free lunch. There was always a price to pay. And we have a saying, and it kind of goes like this. You're going to go on a train ride. Point number one, make sure you do not pay too much for that ticket. Point number two, you don't actually know where the destination is, where you're going. You think you do, 
but you haven't seen it yet and you don't know what it's called and you don't know how long it's going to take you to get there. When you get there, you may not actually like it. So, whilst you're on the train, make sure you look out the window and enjoy the journey. And that's what being a musician is about. It's taking that journey and doing it because you want to do it and it punches your buttons and it punches other people's buttons and you have fun. If you make any money out of it along the way, that really is a bonus. But if you're doing it because you want to make money and be famous and have expensive cars and stuff, go and play roulette or learn how to play cards because you've got far more chance of making money or buy a lottery ticket. Who needs the labels now if you've got all this social networking? Well, as a manager, I'd say, yeah, you still need labels. For the reason I spoke to spoke about earlier on, you've got to stand on somebody's shoulders in order to, to be recognised. You can have somebody help you do that. Yes, you can do your own website. Yes, you can do your own social networking. You can be, get your own street teams. You can set up a, a bedroom studio and make your own recordings. By the way, don't do that. I'll tell you why in a minute. You can do all of that. When are you going to have time to write songs? When are you going to have time to sit there and just muck about on the keys or the guitar or trying different harmonies and stuff because your head's full of, oh yeah, I need to do my Facebook thing tonight and I need to do this and I need to do that and we've got some gigs to book and then we need to kind of pretend this letter and whatever. Left brain, right brain, creative, technical, it gets in the way. Get somebody else to do that for you. Even if it isn't an official manager, get a competent friend who you can trust to do that bit. Take that load off so that you, as a musician, can do the stuff that you're good at. Don't try and do everything. I get about 80 emails a day uh, uh, in my various inboxes. Half of those are demos, or can we send you a demo, or here's a link to my SoundCloud or my MySpace or whatever, have a listen, tell me what you think. I haven't got time to tell them what I think. <laughs> I've got my own artist to look after. Um, I can't sit there and be a free advice centre for artists. So, and I feel exactly the same way as pretty much every record label and manager out there. If you're good at what you're doing, you're busy looking after your, your acts. You're not going to sit there and, and take time out listening to somebody you don't know and then give them free advice, which is going to take your time, when you should be spending that time looking after your own clients. So if you're going to demo somebody or, or, or have, a, have a go at... Uh, um, attracting their attention, make sure you know what you want from them, make sure they can deliver what you want from them, make sure they know what you want. Be specific. So if you're looking for a management deal or a record deal or publishing deal, make sure you say that. And make sure you're sending that to somebody who has the power or at least works in that line of business. Make sure they're interested in the type of music that you've got to offer. Really fundamental stuff. Royalties, recoupables. There used to be two different types of deals. There used to be the major deal and the indie deal. And it kind of, it, over the years, it's kind of drifted into mythology a bit. But effectively, everybody knows the major deal was you found a big label, you went for a meeting in a big office with lots of gold records on the wall, and there's lots of staff rushing about, and it was all very exciting. And they said, yes, we're going to sign you for a five album deal. Um, and we're going to give you this percentage. And everyone went, yeah, great. No one actually knew what it meant, what that percentage was, except how much money they were going to get. They were just really excited that they got signed. But effectively, they sold your records, and, and, and for the privilege of uh, uh, being able to sell your music in the recordings that they made, they would give you anywhere between 5 and 10% of the net receipts calculated in a 97-page document minus packaging, minus this, minus if we had to go and work on a Sunday, it's double that and less that, etc. It was really complex procedures, and you, you'd get that percentage. Except you wouldn't, because you're, you've never recouped what you owed the record company. So you always had an account, and every quarter it would arrive on your doorstep, and you'd look at it and you'd say, well, this month I wrote this, but I've had to pay it back because I still owe this. The other side of it was the indie deal, where you signed a record deal with a smaller company, where you were all in the same boat. 
you had no money, they had no money, you had lots of passion, they had lots of passion. Everybody's in it together. Yeah, we'll get this thing going, we'll work with you, we'll be at the gigs, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work really effectively. And mostly they did that. And the usual deal was, okay, we're gonna take off the costs of what it costs to make this album, which we're gonna agree with you in advance, so we're gonna sit down and say, okay, this album's gonna cost us 15,000 pounds to make and, and market. And are we, are we happy with that? And, and you'd have a list of things which would make it that, that cost breakdown. Everybody would be happy. Then you sold, hopefully, 15,000 copies in order to make sufficient profit to pay that back. Then every copy that you sold after that was usually split 50-50 between the record company and the artist. So you've got a, a share of each. Now, it's any mix of all of that with merchandising thrown in, with live touring income thrown in, with your branding thrown in, if you get sponsorship, that's, that's sometimes included. So all the companies will, will try and, and, and work it so that they can get a financially secure contract with you in order for them to take the risk of making the investment. Don't knock record companies for trying to make a profit. That's what they're there for, they're a business. If they don't make a profit, they can't pay for the offices, they can't pay for the staff, and they wouldn't be there for you to dream about being signed by them as a musician. The thing that you have to consider is, okay, they need to make money, do I think it unreasonable that they need to tie me up for three albums? Do I think it unreasonable that they need to tie me up for five albums? So you need to look at yourself as an artist or look at your artist and think, <coughs> what is my artist worth? What is their market value? If you go to a record company with an artist that has no history, nothing, and you're asking for a record company to, to invest in them, providing the record company also believes in them like you do, then they're going to at least consider it. But with no track record, they're taking a huge risk. You're asking them to put their money where their mouth is and give it to you, to your artist, to support your artist in whatever way it may be, recording, live touring, etc., <coughs> PR, having a PA there to be with you at the radio station to make sure you don't get shafted, etc., whatever. It all costs money. If there's no risk there, then you can argue, well, okay, we'll do it for three albums. First album you lose money, second album you break even, third, third album you, you make some profit hopefully and recoup the losses on the first album. So by that stage everyone's pretty happy. If the relationship's been good, then you renegotiate the deal and stay with that company. If you don't like the company, then after you've delivered your, your contractual requirements, you're free to move on. If you're still an active artist and somebody else is prepared to take you on. Or by that stage your artist may have built up a, a decent fan following and you might think, well we could do it on our own we could sell direct to the fans. People like Simply Red, who were way out of contract years ago, they do exactly that, Marillion. They actually fund all of their albums up front before they even go into the studio. They put out an offering, crowdfunding it's called, and say, we'd like you to fund the album by buying it now, before we've made it. So give us a tenner, and if enough of you give us a tenner, that'll pay for us to go into the studio, make the album, and then we'll just post it to you. No advertising costs, no distribution costs, so, so the, the cost of actually getting the album out to marketplace is much lower, uh, therefore your profit margin is higher. Disadvantage of doing that, you're preaching to the converted. You've got your loyal fan base there, but you're never really going to grow that because all your gigs are going to be the same people, all the same people are going to buy your albums. But for an artist that's already been round the circuit, that doesn't matter. All they want to do is to keep doing what they love doing um, and give less of the earnings from that away to somebody else. So it's all about control. But when you first start out, you can't exert that control because you don't have enough market value, you don't have enough worth. So yeah, you may have to give away um, a lot more than you'd like to. But from a manager's point of view, you have to look at it from the label's point of view as well. You can't just go in and say, I want this for my artist because they, they like your ideas, you're going to be walking out of that office without a deal or any interest in you, and you'll gain a reputation of being an unreasonable manager. Nobody will want to do business with you or talk to you. So you've got to have your business head on. You've got to understand uh, what the push-pull points are of the companies that you're trying to uh, uh, crack a deal with. So try and stay away from kind of falling into the negativity about the industry and the woefulness. It's not negative. It's 
a really positive industry, and it's a privilege uh, and a joy to work in it, and I absolutely love it.